Well, as Rick mentioned, it is certainly good to see so many who've come out on this chilly morning and braved the slippery roads and so forth. I would encourage everybody, if you're able to, and if the weather, of course, cooperates with us over the course of the day, to plan to be here this evening as well as the lesson that we want to consider from the Word of God is not going to be isolated to just this morning, but is going to actually be concluded with this evening's sermon. And so we're going to be talking about, of course, as you can see behind me on the screen there, the Holy Spirit over the course of the day. And that, of course, is a topic that typically generates some confusion as we think about, well, what does the Holy Spirit do? And there's different kinds of questions that arise. And I purposefully kind of planned a lot of those more interesting questions about the Holy Spirit for tonight's lesson to kind of motivate us to want to be here for the second part. So we're going to talk this evening about the indwelling of the Spirit. We're going to talk about the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and then conclude tonight with the gift of the Holy Spirit. But this morning we're going to talk about some more basic things that are required, of course, if we're going to really have a full picture and understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and how He works in our lives and the things that He has done over the course of time. Uh, to establish those things using, of course, again, the Word of God. And so I would encourage everybody to have a Bible open and be ready to follow along with the thoughts that we want to consider. And as Ed worded in his prayer, I appreciated the way that he worded that as he prayed for me, which I always appreciate, but also prayed for all of us to be confirming the things that are taught using the Word of God. And so that's, of course, what we want to do this morning. The Holy Spirit, we want to begin by recognizing the fact that the Holy Spirit is a being. He is an entity. He is not some kind of mystical force field. You you think about Star Wars or something of that nature and they use the force and it's just kind of this ambiguous thing that they tap into, some kind of a power. But the Holy Spirit is not a mist or some kind of a, a ghost. Of course, the King James Version typically renders Holy Spirit as Holy Ghost. And so sometimes maybe we get this idea that he's kind of like this apparition and he just kind of appears in a mist or something of that nature. Let's look at a couple of passages which help us to establish this. In Matthew chapter 28, for example, in verse 19, we have here Jesus giving instruction about how to convert those that would be recipients of the gospel and what that process would entail. And he talks about baptism, of course, in this particular verse. But notice there he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, notice, in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so he lists these three distinct entities, these three distinct persons and Again, to conflict with the idea or combat the idea that he would be some kind of impersonal force field or something of that nature. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, we read here, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit, notice, said. And so we find the Spirit speaking with a voice. Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In the seventh chapter of Acts, verse 51 There you recall how Stephen rebuked certain of the Jews. He called them stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. And notice he says, You resist always the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Another passage uh, that's good for establishing this for us is in John chapter 16 and verse 12. Now here we find Jesus is speaking concerning the coming of the Spirit upon his disciples after he would return back to the Father. And so verse 12 there of John 16, he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, notice how he's described, and notice also the capitalization there, we recognize, of course, that the Spirit is part of the Trinity or the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. But he is spoken of as a he, as a being, as a person. The Spirit of truth, he says, when he has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak. There again, we see the Spirit having a voice. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine, and he will declare it unto you. 
We also see throughout the scriptures made plain for us the fact that the Holy Spirit has a specific work, a specific function, we might say. And particularly, it seems that the Spirit is involved with conveying or revealing the mind of God. And we see this at play even in the very beginning, back in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 there in verse 2, as we read concerning the earth in its infancy, as it was first being spoken into existence by God, we read that the earth was formless, it was void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. At this point, the earth had not seen dry land. It was more or less a ball of water. But notice that the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. And so, as you read through that entire Genesis account, you'll notice that when God speaks, He talks about making man in our image. And it's referenced that there's more than just the Father at work there. And you go to John chapter 1, of course, and it reveals to us that Jesus, of course, played a part in creation, that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all worked together. But as God spoke, we have the indication here that the Spirit moved or brought the Word of God uh, into manifestation or the things that God was uh, speaking to create brought those things into existence. And of course, as we think about the very Word of God that we're reading from this morning, uh, the Bible explains the origin of the Word in that the Spirit revealed that to us and to different ones over the course of time to be written down. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 20, we read, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke, notice, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so it's kind of interesting to compare the language of this physical creation where the Spirit was moving over the face of the deep, and then we have the idea of the Spirit moving to inspire certain men to write down the prophecies or the things that God would have to be known. In John chapter 14 and verse 26, here again we find Christ is relating what the role of the Spirit would be when He would come and baptize more or less the apostles after Jesus returned to heaven. But he says, The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, notice he will teach you all things, and he will bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. And so we get to wondering, well, how did the apostles know what to teach? How did they know what was right and what the truth really was? How did they remember everything that Jesus had taught them? Well, it is explained that the Spirit uh, played a role in that in, in helping them to recount those things and to be revealed unto them what God would have His followers to know. In Acts chapter 2, of course, is where we find the account of these things having their fulfillment, this promise of the Holy Spirit for His apostles and this baptism of the Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, and looking at the first four verses, it says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled, notice, with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues or languages as the Spirit gave them Utterance. And we're going to talk more about the miraculous gifts that certain ones were given in the early church as we go on through the lesson here. Let's also come over here to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 for just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And here we have the Apostle Paul speaking, but he's reasoning concerning the origin of the message that he was preaching. Where did that come from? Was this just his own ideas? Was this just the ideas of the other apostles? Well, he explains this for us here in this particular passage. And so beginning there in verse 9 of 1 Corinthians 2, he says, As it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us, how? Through, he says, his Spirit. <coughs> For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. 
For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? In other words, I can't know what Larry is thinking unless he expresses that in some way to me, whether he uses his words or writes it down on a piece of paper or whatever it might be. So I can't know what's going on in his mind. And so making a larger point then, he says, even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. And so how do we know what's in God's mind, what he wants us to know? Well, the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals that to us and revealed it to the apostles here. Verse 12, he goes on and says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You know, another interesting aspect of this function of the Holy Spirit is that not only do we see that the Spirit reveals to us the mind of God, but we also see a function brought out here in Romans chapter 8 wherein the Spirit actually interprets our minds back to the Father, which is rather, um, rather wonderful and, and a great blessing for us, especially as we think about the avenue of prayer. But notice here in verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit, notice, Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And I don't know about you, but I, I can certainly think of times where uh, perhaps a, a distressing event has taken place or we're in the midst of some kind of a, a difficult time and, and we're praying and we just really can't, uh, think of the words to speak. It's just almost pure emotion that we're trying to convey. And how wonderful to recognize uh, from the Word of God the fact that the Spirit is able to interpret that, that uh, frustration or whatever it might be, however we want to label it, and convey that to God and express that to Him. And so the Spirit, in a sense, works both ways in revealing the minds As we had alluded to or, or caught a glimpse of there in Acts chapter 2 with the apostles and them having that baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit coming upon them and in, imparting uh, knowledge and also these gifts, uh, we want to spend some time talking about that particular thing. The fact that the Spirit in the early church did indeed give certain ones the ability to do miraculous things. And we're going to talk about also, of course, the, the reason for that and why that was carried out in that way. Coming here to Acts chapter 2 once again, now this is after Peter, of course, had spoken and uh, preached really his, the first gospel sermon, as we refer to it as. But he explained to the Jews on that occasion the fact that they had sinned, that they had crucified the very Son of God. And they, of course, were distressed by that. They were convicted of their sins, and they said, Well, men and brethren, what shall we do? You recall in verse 37, and so it was explained to them the need for them to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins in the name of Christ. But jumping down a few verses there to verse 41, it says, Those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And notice, fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. And again, as we looked at the first four verses of the chapter, one of the first manifestations of the Spirit that we saw there was they began to speak in those other tongues or languages. And as you read down through the context, it becomes very apparent that the meaning of that was, well, here's all these Jews from different places, and they've all gathered here in Jerusalem, and they're all saying, well hey, we, we can hear these guys, these Galileans, speaking something that we understand. Well, how did they learn our language? And so it was a miraculous thing that was taking place there for the purpose of getting their attention and creating an avenue through which the gospel could be received. Over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we find a, a passage which kind of outlines what some of these gifts were 
that not only the apostles, of course, had, but the ones that they would lay hands upon were given as well. And we'll see the, the scripture that identifies that fact as well as we as we go forth. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, uh, we read here there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. In other words, Paul's identifying the fact that you have been given these different gifts, but it's all from the same source. And it's all for the same purpose, ultimately. But he says, there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities. It is the same God, though, who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Notice that. As these different ones were given gifts, the goal was for the profit of not just the person, that they could be elevated or glorified as someone special. We think about Simon there in Acts chapter 8. He wanted to buy the gifts so that he could be looked upon as somebody special. But he says the benefit is to be for all, for the, for the church as a whole. So verse 8, to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, which we've talked about, to another the interpretation of tongues. And as you keep reading throughout the book of 1 Corinthians, you get into chapter 14, uh, we see as Paul was discussing the proper use of these gifts that there were indeed some who could speak in the other languages, but then uh, not necessarily be able to interpret it. And so there were others who were given the gift of interpretation. And he talks about the proper use uh, of those gifts together for edification of the body. But verse 11, he says, One and the same Spirit works all of these things, distributing to each one individually as pardon me as he wills in mark chapter 16 is a is a good place for us to go to again identify the the purpose for which these gifts were given in the early church mark chapter 16 verse 19 it says so then after the lord had spoken to them he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of god and they went out that being the disciples or the apostles and, he, and they preached everywhere and the Lord was working with them. How? Well, he was confirming the word through, he says, the accompanying signs. Amen. And so as we recognize this period of time, did they have the New Testament that they could turn to and say, well, here God has said this and God has said that and given us these instructions? Well, they didn't have that yet, did they? That was all still being written down and confirmed. And so for this a specific period of time before that was all accomplished, there was a need then for them to be able to confirm the things that they were speaking and, and establish that, hey, this isn't my idea, this is from God. And so that is how the Lord worked with them through these gifts of the Spirit. Acts chapter 8, verse 18 identifies another important aspect of these gifts, and we had alluded to it a moment ago, again here in the account of Simon the sorcerer. How did he come to find out the, the transference of this power or this, uh, these gifts of the Spirit took place. Well, Simon saw that through, notice, the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. And so at that point, he offered them money. In other words, please lay hands on me so that I can have a gift and I can be someone special. And he was misguided, of course, in his motivations there. But that's an important aspect of it, and it also speaks to the temporal nature of these gifts. It was only the apostles who had the ability to pass those gifts on through the laying on of their hands. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 helps us to see that once the written word was complete, there would be no more need for these pieces and parts, these specific gifts that were given uh, to many in the early church because all things would have been established and recorded. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 8, it says, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. And we had read there in 1 Corinthians 12, some of those gifts were these specific things. Gifts of tongues, gifts of knowledge, gifts of prophecy. And so each different one were, were given some of these different pieces and parts to work together 
But he says eventually there's going to come a time when these are going to pass away. He says, we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect, he says, has come, then that which is in part will be done away. You look at the Greek there that is rendered perfect to teleon. It means the perfect thing. Sometimes people will take this passage and try and make it say that he's talking about Jesus returning. And Jesus is the perfect thing that's talked about here, but that doesn't make sense given the uh, the Greek word. It's not talking about a person. It's talking about a thing. And in this case, it would be the word of God. It's the same word that we find over here in conjunction with the very word of God in James 1 verse 25 when he uh, who looks into the perfect, notice, law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work. He says this one will be blessed in what he does. And so again, once the word was completed and written down, there was no longer a need for individuals to have these miraculous gifts to confirm the things being taught. And so we're going to break there for this morning. I know that it's a little bit shorter than what we're used to. We're going to have a, a couple closing thoughts here uh, as means of an invitation. But I want us to, uh, again, be mindful of some of the, I guess, maybe deeper questions that we want to analyze tonight about the Holy Spirit. As we conclude this morning, I want us to notice something that I think is rather interesting. In Romans chapter 15 and verse 13, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope, notice, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about this morning and established using the Word of God how that one of the primary functions of the Holy Spirit is to reveal the Word, right? To reveal the mind of God to us so that we might know God's will and be able to follow it. And likewise then have the blessings that are promised to those that would be obedient unto God. This word power here is the same word that we read over in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Where Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Notice what he's speaking of. That which the Spirit has revealed. And notice he says it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. If we want to experience the power of the Spirit, well, then we need to read and obey that which the Spirit has revealed to us to know, the gospel, the word of God. The Greek word there that is translated in both of those passages as power is from uh, dunamis, that's the Greek word. And that particular word is defined as inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its very nature, of which a person or thing exerts and puts forth. You want to know one of the English words that we have that is a derivative of this Greek word? Dynamite. And we think about the word dynamite, or we think about what that is, we think about something that can be very dangerous, right? They use that to blast tunnels through mountains, <clears throat> blow things up. The Word of God is designed and capable of blasting men out of complacency and indifference and convicting them of their sin and leading them unto eternal life, leading them to the blood of Christ that we encounter as we are baptized for the forgiveness of our sins, that transforms us, that washes away our sins, and recreates us in Him. What an amazing thing. And so again, this evening we're going to be talking about some further things about the Holy Spirit, but this morning... If you're here and you recognize a need to respond to the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, you know, with it being Valentine's Day, we, we think about this day as a day for couples to express or remind each other, I guess, of their love for one another. But as you think about the greatest manifestation of love that we've ever seen, that mankind has ever known, it is in the Son of God coming to this earth. Despite our sins, despite our imperfections, despite our un deserving uh, nature and giving himself on the cross, suffering and dying 
so that despite how undeserving we are, regardless, we could be given the hope of being delivered from condemnation and and having hope of eternal life. What an amazing love story that truly is. And so if you need to respond to that this morning by repenting of your sins and being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, then we'd love to assist you with that. If you're here this morning and you are a Christian, you wandered astray or need prayers of encouragement in some way, please let those things be known while we stand together and while we sing.